Each month, when we ask you, our know-how audience, to suggest topics for future releases, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning consistently ranks at the top of the list of requested subjects. Hi, I'm Chuck McLennan. Earlier this year, as air conditioning season was beginning, we reviewed procedures for finding leaks and recharging the AC system. By now, the AC cooling season is just about over for most of us. After the hot summer we've had, I'm sure a lot of you are glad to see it go. So, in this program, we'll review the operation of the entire climate control system. Specifically, we'll look at the different versions of the CJ2 automatic dual zone system. Also, later in the program, we'll take a brief visit to the Southwest to get some useful tips from a local technician who's seen quite a few heating and cooling configurations come and go. As you may recall, CJ2 Automatic Dual Zone Climate Control first appeared on the 1991 Park Avenue. It was derived from the C68 automatic system, which itself had been around since the mid-80s, and is still in use today with several modifications. As was stated in the service manual at the time, the basic intention of the system design was to automatically provide a comfortable environment inside the vehicle regardless of ambient weather conditions. And that's still the idea. Using a single temperature switch, the driver simply selects the desired interior temperature on the vacuum fluorescent display on the face of the control head. A microprocessor then takes over the operation of all the various controls required to reach and maintain the selected values. The dual zone CJ2 system further enhances C68 by adding individual controls so that front seat passengers can increase or decrease the air temperature from the vents on their side of the car. In recent years, the soft touch buttons and switches used on Buick CJ2 systems have been simplified somewhat. As a result, the layout of these controls and their functions are pretty much the same on all 1998 and 99 cars. As I'll examine later, there are a few small differences that can sometimes cause Buick owners a little confusion. But first, let's take a look inside the systems, behind the scenes if you like. While the control heads have only small differences, there are some considerable differences in the way CJ2 has evolved among the various GM platforms. On current Buick models, there are four CJ2 configurations. These four systems can be broadly classified into two basic types. The CJ2 systems used in LeSabre, Regal, and Century models are both vacuum and electronically controlled. This familiar arrangement from a LeSabre has been around for some time. Vacuum-controlled actuators move the doors or valves that direct the flow of air through the HVAC module. Similar actuators are used in Regal and Century. On LeSabre, the HVAC programmer contains the solenoid-activated valves that control vacuum supply to the actuators. These solenoids are activated by signals from the HVAC programmer, as different modes are selected on the control head, manually or automatically. On Regal and Century, these solenoids are located in the vacuum electric solenoid pack located beside the blower motor behind the right side hush panel. On all CJ2 systems, there are two air mix valve actuators, one each for the driver and passenger side. To move the air mix doors, these electronic actuators use small reversible DC motors with feedback potentiometers that signal the position of the doors to the programmer. When maximum heating is required, the motors move the valves to direct all airflow through the heater core. For maximum cooling, the valve doors block all air from entering the heater core. The CJ2 systems on Park Avenue and Riviera use no solenoid vacuum actuators. All valve doors are opened and closed by electronic actuators like the air mix valves. On Park Avenue, there are four mode actuators. One actuator operates the air inlet door. Another controls the AC and defroster mode doors. 
On Riviera, separate actuators are used for the AC and defroster mode doors. So, there are five actuators altogether. When servicing any of these actuators, remember, each is specifically designed for use on either the left or right side of the HVAC module and must be replaced accordingly. You may remember on early CJ2 configurations, a dual zone button on the head activated the passenger controls. Among current 1998 and 99 Buicks, the dual button appears in Regal and Century models only. On Le Sabre, Park Avenue, and Riviera, dual zone mode is automatically activated when the passenger temperature buttons are pressed. Pressing the off button once returns the system to the single zone operation. A second press turns off the entire HVAC system and the LED in the button. Remember though, even when the system is off, with both the blower motor and AC compressor inoperative, the CJ2 microprocessor still attempts to maintain the temperature that's set on the control head. Since the compressor is off, it cannot cool or dehumidify the incoming air. In cool conditions, the programmer warms air by signaling the air mix valve to direct incoming air over the heater core. Let's look at the other controls. The off button I've already discussed. Beside that is the auto button that cycles climate control between fully automatic and manual operation. In the auto mode, the HVAC programmer takes over the operation of the entire system based on the selected temperature and input it receives from a number of sensors, as I'll discuss shortly. The programmer sends a voltage signal to the solid state blower control module. The module amplifies the programmer signal and applies between 4 and 12 volts to run the blower motor at an appropriate speed to match conditions. The driver can override automatic blower control by pressing the fan speed switch up for maximum and down for minimum speed. Once a manual fan speed is selected, the blower will continue to operate at this level regardless of temperature conditions until the fan switch is pressed again. Other functions will continue in the auto mode. I mentioned that in addition to HVAC controls, the programmer evaluates information provided by its network of sensors to determine which airflow mode is most appropriate. The programmer then energizes the particular valve actuators as required to enter this mode. Most of the sensors we've looked at in earlier programs, so I'll just run through them briefly. There's the AC pressure sensor mounted on the high side of the compressor hose assembly between the condenser and the evaporator. The PCM constantly monitors AC line pressure and disengages the compressor clutch when pressure is too high or too low. The PCM also boosts engine idle speed to compensate for AC load and controls the operation of the engine cooling fans. On all models, there's also an inside temperature sensor in the IP. And there's an outside or ambient temperature sensor mounted near the front of the car. This outside air temperature sensor provides the data for the temperature display. The programmer compares exterior and interior temperatures. More newer temperature sensors are used on 97 through current Park Avenue for more precise control. Two in the hush panels measure actual discharge temperatures coming from the floor outlets on each side. Two more are positioned in the left and right side IP duct outlets. Then there are two sun load sensors that are positioned on top of the IP where they measure the intensity of the sunlight. There are a number of possible airflow modes the programmer can choose when it's operating in automatic. These modes can also be selected manually using the airflow button. I think the mode names are pretty self-explanatory. There's floor, floor mid, similar to bi-level, there's mid alone, and finally windshield and floor. In each of these modes, the HVAC programmer signal opens the outside air inlet so the blower pulls outside air into the system. Also, in any of these modes, if outside temperature is above 43 degrees, 
The AC compressor is activated and runs continually to keep the evaporator core just above freezing at about 33 degrees. As I mentioned earlier, the compressor clutch is controlled by the PCM, which can override the control head commands when it determines engine load should be reduced. This might occur under full throttle or during heavy power steering maneuvers. In Park Avenue, the HVAC programmer module is part of and communicates with the PCM on the Class II data bus. The compressor continues to run as long as the PCM doesn't shut it off and the vent button is not pressed. When the vent mode is selected, the AC compressor is turned off. If auto is also selected, the programmer attempts to maintain selected temperatures using outside air. This is similar to the economy mode on earlier systems. When the recirc button is pressed, it limits the amount of outside air entering the system. The air inside the car is reused. Pressing the front defrost button also cancels the recirc mode. This is to avoid window fogging, which would occur if the two were run together. When CJ2 is off, pressing recirc turns the system on and restores whatever setting was in use when it was turned off. In the auto mode, the programmer uses information from the sensors to determine whether outside air is drawn into the system or whether the air inside the vehicle is recirculated. The temperature selector adjusts the set temperature level in one degree increments between 65 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. If the system is off, pressing the temperature button turns it on in the auto mode. You'll notice the soft touch control buttons on Regal and Century do not beep when they are pressed. That's one of those small differences I referred to earlier. Another concerns the temperature control. The auto temperature range for all vehicles is from 60 to 90 degrees. On LeSabre, Park Avenue and Riviera models, when the temp button is pressed below 65 degrees, the display goes directly to 60 degrees. The auto LED remains illuminated. On Regal and Century CJ2, the display continues to decrease in one degree increments from 65 to 60. When 60 degrees is reached, the auto LED goes off, but the system continues to cool until the maximum cooling capacity is reached. The blower speed will also continue to increase, as we can see here. The same situation occurs on the warm side, between 85 and 90 degrees. The Park Avenue and other systems jump directly from 85 to 90, while Regal and Century move in one degree steps. It is important to note that on Regal and Century, the LED on the auto button does not illuminate when the system is operating outside the 60 to 90 degree auto range although the auto mode is still operating. As I mentioned, when the AC compressor is running, air flowing through the CJ2 system is cooled to near freezing, dehumidified, then heated as necessary to achieve the requested temperature. For cooling, all Buicks now use the V5 variable displacement compressor. And that brings us to our special guest for this program. We traveled to Tony Curry Buick in Mesa, Arizona, we knew it got pretty warm there, and we weren't disappointed. Our trip was to meet Larry Hayes, who has been the expert AC tech at the dealership for quite a few years. Larry is also an active member of the Mobile Air Conditioning Society. He shared with us a collection of cutaway compressors that illustrate how the HR6 developed into the HD6, and finally, the V5 in production today. 1983 through 93, General Motors used a DA6 and the HR6 compressor, which had the suction side reed plate against the discharge reed plate in the rear and the front of the compressor. In 1994, they went to the HD6 compressor that had the reed plate at the end of the piston. The refrigerant come in through the low side into the center of the compressor and it was sucked in through the low side at the end of the compressor, which made for a smoother operation of the compressor and quieter for the customer. On the cutaway version, you can clearly see the wobble plate that varies the stroke of the five pistons to match the required compression capacity. 
Larry had a reminder also about replacing compressor shaft seals. The single lip seal was used until July of 96, and then they went to the double lip seal. And after the production of the double lip seal, if you replace a single lip seal, you always replace it with a double lip seal. Any factory compressor that has a double lip seal in it will have a larger O-ring that goes in there. Identify the O-ring to make sure that you put in the proper O-ring with the seal. Larry has a setup that uses an old blower motor and an inductive ammeter to show how blower performance can be gauged by measuring the motor's current draw. One way I test a blower motor is if you have a problem with blowing fuses, you can hook an amp meter up to the blower motor and see how many amps the blower is drawing. If the motor, in this case with the battery just sitting there and we're at about 12 volts, the amps have drawn 22 amps. If you take and hook up the battery charger, so you get about 14 volts out of the battery like you're driving down the road, you will see that you will draw more amps. Larry pointed out that a restricted motor, and that's one of the most common service problems, will affect current draw. Another way to test a blower motor is if the evaporator core is plugged up, and you want to know if that's the cause. If you restrict the flow on the blower motor, the amps will go down. If you got a cabin filter problem and you restrict the intake air, the amps will be less. If you have an older car with a blower motor concern, and if it had a blower motor replaced, it might have the wrong one and revert and the impeller is going the wrong way. One way to test it is reverse is to put an amp meter on there and read the amperage of the blower motor. You will see that the voltage increase in the amps will be a lot less because the motor has no restriction to it. That indicates that the fan is on the impeller wrong or the blower motor is the wrong way. We also picked up some advice from Larry that's very helpful when installing inline filters on the AC line. That's something you'll probably be doing more often as R134A systems age. When installing a sausage type design filter kit on a half inch line or a 3 8 line, after pulling the insulation back, and when you cut the line with the tubing cutter, After cutting the tube and, and deburring the outside and inside of the tubing, because of the design of the sausage style filter with the orifice tube, the screen does not want to clear the tubing. I take a 2560 force reamer in a cordless drill and I ream the inside of the tube out. After I ream it out, I take a Q-tip and dip it in mineral oil, 525 refrigeration oil, and wipe the inside out to get all the chips out, and then the filter kit will slide in there without damaging the screen. While we were in Arizona, Dolph Levick of Delphi Harrison brought to our attention a belt rubbing condition that's been observed on the 1998 Park Avenue only. When the compressor is under very heavy load, the serpentine belt can twist sufficiently so that it contacts or almost contacts the engine support bracket stud. When the accelerator is released on deceleration, tension on the belt reduces and it slaps against the stud. When it was first observed in the field, the condition was mistaken for a compressor problem. I hope the information in this video will clarify the differences and similarities among the CJ2 configurations that appear in the various Buick car lines. You'll find diagnostic information for each system in the reference manual with this program. Thanks for watching. For now, so long, and I'll see you in the next Buick Know How.